um, this next session, um, I think you'll find um, very thought-provoking. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce you to um, Steve Wilson, who is the uh, VP and Principal Analyst at Research Constellation. Um, and he'll be challenging you with some of his thoughts um, and his research on identity in blockchain in his presentation entitled, There is no ID in blockchain. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. <coughs> Thanks, everybody. So as I'm sure you're all aware, in 2008, this obscure paper was released by person or persons unknown. Rumour started last year that this person might have been an Australian and I was really flattered when somebody suggested that maybe it was me. <laughs> it was the second most flattering thing. My eight-year-old son at one point thought that I must have built the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which um, may last longer than the blockchain. So the blockchain um, specified, or rather the Bitcoin paper, specified this thing that has since become known as the blockchain. The blockchain was designed expressly for one thing and one thing only, and it was to solve the double spend problem. Technically, what blockchain does, as we'll see, is that it provides consensus across a distributed community about the order of entries uh, in a ledger. And that's all it does. And it doesn't even do that very well. So the interesting thing is, how did this become a publication phenomenon? The number of people on the slide there, in fact, have made their reputations in the last 18 months on the back of blockchain. Um, stating things about blockchain that are just untrue. The, the most notable thing about these books is that blockchain does not do uh, the things that are claimed for it. It does this very specific, very dry cryptographic trick of proving the order of entries without a central umpire. For Bitcoin, that's insanely important. And as we'll see, it was thought to be an, ins uh, an impossible problem. And for blockchain to come out of nowhere, for Nakamoto to come out of nowhere and solve this um, impossible problem, was genuinely inspiring, and we've already seen some things this week about where that's led to through, through patient application of, um, of design principles. Now, um, it's said that a billion dollars has been invested already in blockchain startups, um, like that is raison d'etre for the, for the algorithm. All sorts of things are said about blockchain. Um, it's said that blockchain will crowdsource the governance of the financial system. That's a million miles from what Nakamoto was trying to do. It's said that blockchain, and I quote, is going to end corruption in Africa. <laughs> and we already saw something this morning about blockchain being um, quoted by UNICEF as something that will um, help them solve childhood poverty. Now, these things aren't funny. I mean, I find those sorts of claims absolutely abhorrent. So we go from the sublime to the ridiculous. The firefighters are told that once they use Bluetooth to connect their internet-connected devices onto the blockchain, whatever that means, then they're going to get unlimited communication channels. Um, I mean, it, th these sorts of things speak for themselves. I don't know where they get these ideas from, but I have a hunch that it's got to do with taking the magic properties of solving the double spend problem without an umpire and, um, and running away with that idea, quite literally. So let's um, just remind ourselves of precisely what blockchain does. The problem with double spend, of course, is that somebody needs to watch every single transaction that's happening with digital money, every single transaction. And for 30 years, we thought that that had to be done with a central uh, mint or a reserve bank. The most famous e-cash until now was um, David Chalm's algorithm, which, which involved a central bank. Nakamoto um, wanted to solve a problem, and he wanted to solve it in a particular way. He wanted to solve it without an umpire. And a number of people I've spoken to over the years have said, you know, if Nakamoto was trying to solve that with an umpire, he would have come up with something quite different. What he did, of course, was to, in a sense, crowdsource the consensus of the order of entries, which is hardly crowdsourcing consensus on the governance of the financial system. But so what we're doing is setting up a consensus algorithm with proof of work in this particular case distributed across an enormous number of nodes and those nodes are, are um, incentivated, as you probably know, through mining. Now, in effect, um, every node in the system that's participating in supporting the blockchain is being rewarded randomly with blockchain, with, uh, with Bitcoin. Randomly paid Bitcoin for being part of the network. Um, the first time I heard it positioned in that way, I thought, oh, you're glossing over the details of proof of work. And 
the brute force attack on the hashing puzzles and all that stuff that I'm sure you're familiar with. But all of that is just a means to an end. The, the reality is that tens of millions of computers are being rewarded randomly and all they're doing is bumping up their odds of being rewarded by doing more work. So you improve the odds of, of getting that random lottery win by having a, a supercomputer in your backyard. It's, it's, only a, it's only a matter of odds. Now, in a sense, that squared the circle, right? We didn't think it could be done. It was done. Um, but if you're of a mind to say that Nakamoto squared the circle, the question is, so what? I mean, let's just think about geometry. If you, solved the, if you, if you squared the circle in, circle in geometry, is that going to give you some sort of new um, algorithm for factoring prime numbers, or is it going to give you um, some sort of new way of doing calculus? The, the blockchain problem, I remind you, is really, really specific. <laughs> Nevertheless, there's been this rush of blood to the head with all sorts of new possibilities and new applications, all enabled by the fact that the blockchain or Bitcoin APIs allow you to add ancillary data to the, um, to the entries when you, when you move Bitcoin you can add some other metadata to the, um, to the records. So we've had, um, pardon me on the sound, pardon me, uh, we've had um, the suggestion of land titles being moved around on the blockchain. We've had diamonds on the blockchain. We've got um, identity on the blockchain, as we heard. Um, it has to be said that the, di that the um, land title use case on the blockchain has never been anything more than a press release. The startup company Factom um, went into some sort of deal with the government of Honduras to do uh, land titles on the blockchain. Um, and that project seemed to go to custard after some months and the parties are in some sort of dispute about the reality of the press release. It um, beggars belief that um, some people who should know better are still using the fact on Honduras case as a, as a case study or a use case for land titles on the blockchain. It's a press release. Um, the company uh, Ever Ledger is doing better with diamonds on the blockchain, but I'll come back to that. Um, the most important thing about all of these cases that we've heard of is that they're not setting out the problem that they're solving, and they're even using the word security with gay abandon. Um, the immutability of the blockchain is something, and I'm certainly um, not here to deny that the blockchain in its current form is more or less unhackable, but I think we all know that you know, I um, for integrity is only one part of the CIA um, trifecta in security. And for anybody to get terribly um, obsessed with immutability of the ledger, I think is kind of missing the point. There's more to it. So um, I don't like to see non-security professionals claim that something is secure without unpacking what the properties are that they're actually trying to get to. Now, I guess I'll just go back and say my point about diamonds on the blockchain. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to find an explanation of, of, of blockchain that doesn't use metaphors. Um, and the classic metaphor is, is simply the word on. People talk about diamonds on the blockchain or land titles on the blockchain. The only thing that's on the blockchain is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the classic digital bearer token. It's got intrinsic value because people demand it and the Bitcoin itself, the evidence of Bitcoin movements, is the only thing that's on the blockchain. Everything else is metadata and everything else is bindings or code that says this particular code that I'm writing onto that API represents a diamond. So the way that Everledger works, um, all major diamonds in the world now are, are, are etched by laser with a barcode or a serial number, and Everledger takes that barcode serial number, binds that to an entry in the blockchain and puts that onto the blockchain. I mean, I think it's needless to say there's no diamonds on the blockchain. But the most important thing about that story is that a broker has said at some point in the world, maybe at a diamond mine, the broker has said, here's diamond one, two, three, four, and I'm putting that code into the blockchain. Um, that is expressly not what blockchain was designed to do, as we'll see. So look, the serious limitations, the, the most important fundamental limitation is that this thing was designed to be trustless, and it's, it has to be trustless insofar as any permissioning system or any access control system that um, gates people participating in the mining or in the network is going to shrink the size of the network and it's going to erode the security promises that are made about the very scale of the thing. So in a really important sense, blockchain doesn't scale down. It's kind of ironic that way. Um, there's a lot of talk about identity. 
and there's a lot of talk about trustlessness, but I think that we need to remember that all identities are authorised, all non-trivial identities are authorised. We're hearing a lot about self-sovereign identity and I think that that's an interesting and, and, and really radically new um, problem and I'm interested in, in, in how that is solved. But all identities today are impressed upon us, all important identities are impressed upon us by some sort of um, counterparty. Now we can try and imagine a nirvana which changes the way that banks and governments identify us, but for the time being, all of those identities in some sense are given to us by a trusted third party. And so there's a broker, there's inevitably a broker or an intermediary standing between truth and the stuff that goes onto the blockchain. Now, if you understand that, but you go back to Nakamoto's paper about why is there 10 million computers out there all voting and every 10 minutes coming up with agreement on the ledger, the reason why the algorithm is so elaborate and so enormous is that you don't trust the people that are in the nodes. As soon as you do start to trust people in the nodes, then blockchain itself starts to become over-engineered. And so again, I just want to say that there's nothing on the blockchain. Things only get on the blockchain via some sort of metaphor or some sort of code, some sort of symbol that's created by a third party. Nakamoto himself, in the very second sentence of his paper, said that if you're going to put a third party into the system, then you're losing the benefit of what we're doing. And so, um, you know, we talk about metaphors, but it seems to me that you've built a beautiful solar car that's going to fly across the continent um, on nothing but solar energy on those elaborate panels that you see, but then somebody realises that that car's not as practical as they'd like and they want to put their family in the back, and so they're going to put a petrol engine on the back of that solar car. And um, what does that do to your original design? We're talking about design. Let's remember the design integrity. And let's remember that if you've fitted out your car with solar panels, but then you're going to put a petrol engine on the back of it, um, you need to go back to basics. You need to redesign what you're all about. Now, I think that blockchain and Bitcoin are obviously just the beginning. Um, and I completely acknowledge the importance of Bitcoin as being an inspiration for everything else that follows. If anybody in the room um, uh, is a cryptographer, you may remember this thing called Merkel's Puzzles back in 1976, I think. Um, Mer Ralph Merkel came out of nowhere with a solution to key exchange uh, in public. Um, his algorithm was outrageously elaborate. It couldn't possibly be done. It's a lot like blockchain. Um, but within three or four years, we had Diffie Holman and we had RSA come along to solve the public key exchange problem with public key cryptography in a really elegant and artful way that's with us still today. So I like to say that um, uh, blockchain, for all of its faults, is actually the Merkel's puzzle of cryptocurrency and, and maybe the Merkel's puzzles of, um, of protocols that we've yet to see develop. But we can't call blockchain a, a value, an internet of value, as some people like to. The idea that the blockchain itself is the internet of value overlooks the fact that nothing valuable gets onto the blockchain without the intermediaries that Nakamoto was trying to get rid of. Now, with that in mind, the really good work that's happening going forward, we've heard already from R3, or heard about R3 CEV, the consortium in New York that are reimagining what could be done with consensus algorithms between parties that may not fully trust each other, but they're permissioned. And what R3 is coming up with, with their first release quarter, um, doesn't appear to have any blockchain in it whatsoever, but there's a really good um, design dissertation from the CTO of, um, of R3, which I commend to you. Um, Hyperledger, we've yet to see a lot of real applications come out of Hyperledger, but a, but a big code base. In fact, I think five different code bases in Hyperledger. And um, Microsoft and Ethereum working together to do what they call blockchain as a service. Um, I've said that R3 sets out a design problem. The other um, organisation that I think has done a really immaculate job of this so far is Ping and Swirls. And we heard today from Patrick uh, about the design problem as they see it, what problem are they trying to solve in identity, what are the problems with the existing ledger technologies or consensus technologies, and why does Hashgraph do a better job of anything else? So there's this trope right, going around, let's do security by design. Um, and I think it's just crazy that we're not setting out the problem that we're trying to solve, matching the available technologies and then making some sort of decision. So that's good to see. And you know, um, the other sort of precedent or, or model for this is the Wright Brothers flyer. 
Um, it's like Merkel's puzzles, right? It was an outrageous solution to something that couldn't be done. They said you couldn't fly. We got into this contraption, they flew 20 yards, which is shorter than the wingspan of an <laughs> airplane today. Um, I don't think the Wright Brothers' flyer itself changed the world, but powered flight changed the world, and airports changed the world, and business models, and things that could not have been imagined in 1903. So, to, to, to wrap up my position, I think blockchain, frankly, I think blockchain may disappear in, in two years' time. I think it will collapse under its own weight. But we are going to see cryptocurrencies, and we are going to see distributed consensus. Um, I'm just not going to stand up here and predict, like some would have me predict, exactly what the, what the world's going to look like in another five or ten years' time. Thanks very much.